Um, so, as uh, kind of demonstrated by the presentation by Irene, Kenya is just a reflection of what is happening around a lot of countries in terms of uh, how public finance management, uh, mismanagement of resources has been happening. But then in this regard, there is a situation in which um, there is a growing uh, illicit financial flow environment that is taking shape in the East African region which I will try to highlight uh, from my presentation. So just to highlight what illicit financial flows are, um, Irene had kind of given us a general uh, definition, but what I want to highlight here is that um, illicit financial flows happen both in a criminal way and in a legal sense as well. So the UN definition of illicit financial flows speaks mainly to the illegal aspects of IFFs, issues that are related to crime. Um, and therefore they are codified uh, in the criminal uh, systems of countries. And therefore they can track whether it is um, uh, money laundering, uh, proceeds of crime, and so forth. Therefore, that together with tax evasion, which is a criminal uh, act, are mainly what are codified in uh, the UN definition. However, based on the high-level panel of the African Union, which uh, Jason had mentioned, the definition of illicit financial flows expands to include tax avoidance in that it brings in the, the, the immoral aspect uh, involved in tax issues and in the avoidance of uh, the legal statutes that are within countries or the legal systems within countries. And therefore, in this respect, with a more stringent definition, we therefore place greater responsibility on governments to reform their tax architecture, to not only prevent uh, criminal aspects of illicit financial flows, but also work towards curbing uh, the legal aspects or the aspects that emerge from tax avoidance. So this list here kind of highlights mainly uh, activities related to uh, the criminal aspect. So that's issues like corruption, extortion, uh, evasion, transfer mispricing, uh, money laundering, other criminal proceeds, um, hiding of wealth in offshore havens, uh, smuggling. So all the aspects in which um, there is a monetary benefit that affects mainly uh, the process of strengthening domestic uh, revenue mobilization in countries. So this is just a general description of what kind of activities uh, are involved in that. So in my next slide, which I don't know if it is clear enough, I think um, I get this from uh, the tax justice fact sheet on uh, illicit financial flows. Here we attempt to see kind of the scope of issues related to um, related to SDGs, so that we can see how to tackle them. And uh, maybe let me zoom in. Uh, this uh, right. Uh, so that we can get at least. So, for instance, in the case of uh, migration, uh, we see the relationships to IFFs um, in terms of the proceeds coming from human trafficking. And the intended uh, interventions are that we must stop this so that we don't generate uh, financing from that, but also bring dignity in the process of migration. Um, 
Now, this is related to SDG 10.7. Now, in relation to SDG 12 point, sorry, 10.7, but in 12.7, which is related to public procurement, it's about transparent and corruption-free public procurement because you realize this is an avenue in which a lot of uh, corruption and uh, mismanagement of public funds happens. So the, we, we have to work to get interventions that prevent this. Um, in terms of SDG 12, 14, and 15, it's about the oceans and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, essentially linking this to exploitation of natural resources and uh, the conversations around that. How can we improve? Here you probably see the linkages to things like um, EITI, which is the, the standard set in terms of uh, uh, extractive uh, transparency initiative. <clears throat> Reduction of corruption based on uh, SDG 16.5, trying to prevent corruption. 16.6, uh, .6, championing for sound institutions that are pro-people, uh, promoting uh, universal social economic development, public access to information based on 16.10, uh, very much linked to the conversations we talk about, for instance, on freedom of information, and so on and so forth. So we have also domestic revenue mobilization as countries are strengthening themselves to use the attack to raise the needed revenues for their development. Uh, if I if I may go to the next section, there you find uh, in terms of regulation of markets, so that um, there is macroeconomic stability. Uh, since poor, poorly regulated markets are open for um, risk in terms of uh, economic stability. Uh, the issue of cheaper remittances, fluidity of the system, but also proper regulation, because this is also a, a means between which uh, IFFs takes place, access to financial services. Um, in this sense, um, identification using identification documents so that we prevent issues of um, money laundering, uh, championing small and medium enterprise development under SDG 8.3, creating the relevant environment for their development. But also, as I will highlight later, um, putting in the mechanism so that they are not misused in terms of vehicles of uh, illicit financial flows. Prevention of violence against women linked to human trafficking, tobacco control uh, linked to issues of um, uh, illicit trade of tobacco and so forth. And also agricultural incomes. Uh, if you look at the linkage to uh, products such as uh, heroin that comes from agricultural products and the illicit uh, uh, funds that come from that. So trying to get interventions in that regard. So I may just frame that sorry now um, to understand the characteristics of IFFs uh, we have to try and understand um, what are the sources of IFFs um, in this regard and this is why the definition to include uh, a broader uh, understanding of what IFFs means in terms of the legal and illegal aspects becomes important. So we realize um, public corruption accounts for only 5% of IFFs. Uh, criminal activities account for about uh, 33%. So if you take the illegal aspects, that amounts to about 38%. The rest arises out of uh, commercial activities and how they are legally facilitated uh, to avoid taxation. And so this is why that broad-based perspective is very important so that we can look at how do we stem these systematic and structural uh, issues that actually facilitate the loss of funds needed 
uh, within developing countries. Um, so within the commercial activities, you have issues like tax-based erosion and profit shifting, where there is tax avoidance in that uh, there is exploitation of gaps in the tax regimes to shift profits to low or no tax location. So you find based on um, how countries uh, look at uh, taxation that is favorable or lower, multinational companies in particular are able to shift their profits to avoid taxation in, uh, in, in jurisdictions where they feel that they'll be taxed more. So that's one. There's also the abuse of transfer misprices where you manipulate the trade prices within companies that operate as subsidiaries uh, so that again, you avoid tax bills. So for instance, um, based on countries that have subsidiaries in different jurisdictions, so you make different claims uh, with the revenue authorities so that you can avoid the high tax bills. Um, other than the mispricing of, good, of, of, of goods, there's also the mispricing of services. You can claim that you have been uh, receiving services from a lower tax jurisdiction so that you can avoid and claim the lower, to pay the lower tax as opposed to the higher tax. Um, a good e example of this has been um, in the popular media now has been the, the case that has been uh, around uh, sport, pe sport PESA, where they claim that they had um, a consultant who was offering services to them, uh, te technological services, which for which they paid higher to avoid the tax bill here. And then again, just abusive tax exceptions where you take uh, incentives and exceptions in the race to the bottom, therefore increasing um, uh, or avoiding or claiming that based on uh, financial, uh, sorry, the foreign direct investment that you can avoid some certain taxes. So these are just some of the characteristics in terms of uh, co commercial activities. Sorry, this was, is it still connecting? I think uh, I'm trying to move to the next slide and it's, excuse me. So, sorry, just one moment. It seems you are having some connection issue. Uh, I think it had refused to share. Let me, let me try sharing again. Um, I think again, it's Okay, so yeah, and then uh, as I was saying, um, then a bit of just understanding, um, as I'd mentioned, corrupt, corruption of public officials and criminal activities. Um, but then there are drivers of um, IFFs. So the traditional understanding of this has been that capital will move to where it gets the highest return. And so this has been the general economic argument that if, for instance, you have a, a terrible macroeconomic structure, then capital will move out of your jurisdictions. But there are also structural drivers in that based on the fiscal monetary architecture, and maybe I might add a legislative uh, structure that is the composition of your economy, 
then it could either encourage money to move in and out of the economy. And so once you understand that, then you start seeing the arguments that we are trying to make about uh, IFFs. And in understanding that, you start to see certain red flags. From Irene's presentation earlier, uh, and if you look at the example of Kemsa, the Kemsa scandal, or other scandals that have taken place in Kenya or in other jurisdictions within the region, you see a number of these characteristics. The first one, the mention or the identification of shell companies. Now that we have been speaking about Kemsa, the mention of shell companies, companies that are formed in two weeks and can process uh, big payments in record time. In three weeks, a, a company is operating like it has been there for 10, 10 years. Uh, secondly, involvement of blacklisted or sanctioned individuals or companies in award processes. In the news you might have seen in Kenya recently, there has been conversations about a company that was blacklisted, I think by the AU and the World Bank, but it managed to get a contract in, in I think, a, a, in construction of a dam. So there's a lot of that. Um, then a lot of the conversations, there's always this linkage to abuse of office, um, the issues of um, conflict of interest, and directly linked to politically exposed persons. Um, again, from media coverage, from discussions in the public, you see uh, the question of um, politicians and their friends and cronies involved in these processes. Followed by this is the failure to ascertain and verify the ultimate beneficial owners. Um, a lot of this, um, you can't really pinpoint who are the owners. I think one thing in particular about the Kemsa scandal is I think for the first time, in as much as it is not believable that these are the owners, we are putting names or faces to ownership, but there is still more that needs to be done because for a long time, even in the media, you would see people referring to companies. So right now, the reference is an, a reference to an organization where the problem is happening, Kemsa. But if you even look at the tags of, of, of previous scandals, Anglo Leasing was a company, but we never really knew the names other than a few mentions name and there, names here and there. Uh, Goldenberg was a company, um, I think because of how much it went, but the reference now, I think with that case, the reference to Kamlesh was quite clear, but there's a lot of, whenever you open, particularly Anglo leasing, you find a company within a company and even sections of it is always about a company, but not really the faces behind that. Um, Other than that, uh, weak enforcement and anti-bribery and corrupt in, of anti-bribery and corruption laws. Uh, my colleague had mentioned that uh, there is very weak enforcement to the point that we never really know who will ever pay for the crime committed. Um, then there is a monopolistic market. I think the the Kemsa case is a very clear one that has pointed out how it's a very small group of people who actually can, who are the shakers and movers in health procurement in the country. Um, so there is that as a, another characteristic and red flag, diversion of revenue from government coffers to individuals and companies. Uh, of course, the, that's the corruption itself. Uh, Non-enforcement of uniform standards. This particular is, is an issue that now has clearly arisen in the context of emergency procurement. Uh, if you take this case that you're talking about, Kemsa, the non-enforcement of uniform standards, how people were getting tenders, um, ranging from prayers to walking through the door uh, and just simply getting the tender all the way to people who could have been uh, pre-qualified. That non-enforcement is a clear indicator that in a country such as Kenya, there is obviously that um, 
there are lots of IFFs and of course uh, rent seeking by authorities or with or people within the industry. So there is that mention that people within the industry are the movers and shakers so that they can get rents from um, companies. Now, I think one of the, just to highlight, one of the stories that has been in the news has been this uh, expose by African Censored that clearly kind of showed the web of this lady called Stella Nyamu. Um, this, in terms of just how she operates the companies, how she registers them, how they ended up uh, in corruption. And I think this was directly related to the question of uh, Aurora and Kimware. Um, the speed in which the companies were opened, how they got the monies and that whole transaction kind of showed the web of, of how this is taking place. Now, I'll maybe have to just do that a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll try and read through this. We have to then understand this is all happening in a state of tax injustice across the world. And this information was gotten from the State of Just Tax, Just, uh, tax Justice Report of 2020 by the Tax Justice Network based in the UK that highlighted uh, how these tax injustices are happening across the world. Therefore, kind of clustering the situation for uh, different regions. Now in Africa, you can see uh, the figure here speaks of uh, a loss of about 25 uh, billion every year to tax abuse, which accounts to 6.9% of the region average tax revenue. Uh, this is obviously greater than the global average that is 2.61%. And it's equivalent to $21 for every citizen of Africa. Um, so if you break down the amounts lost uh, by tax abuse committed by multinationals, you find them that's the majority that comes to 23 billion. And then others based on tax uh, evasion and other issues comes to about 2 billion. So you can see how the corporate sector actually accounts for a large amount of this. Um, the social impact, and uh, I think because of the COVID situation, the focus was mainly on health. Uh, the loss amounts to more than half of health spending in Africa. If you look and you compare this to the suffered tax loss that is equivalent to paying yearly salaries for nurses, it's uh, equivalent to the loss for about 10 million nurses in the region. Um, and it's equivalent to 28.67% of the region's combined education spending. Now on the nurses figures, for instance, and I'll kind of get back to this, um, it's not only about existing nurses, but also preventing the ability to get more nurses in, in the future. Um, from this also, we understand, for instance, how do these jurisdictions affect other regions and whatnot. So in as much as we are harmed, there's also the possibility that we are other, uh, harming either other countries or regions and so forth. So in terms of the revenues lost based on our structures or African structures, about uh, 4 billion, uh, 3 billion that enables uh, global corporate uh, tax abuse and 1 billion thereabouts private tax evasion. This accounts to about 1.1% of global uh, tax losses. Um, then in terms of the globe, it's about 300,000 nurses. The top five biggest losers in Africa are Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, Angola, and South Sudan. But the offenders in Africa are mainly Mauritius, Libya, Liberia, Algeria, 
and Ghana. So if we go straight into looking at how the tax losses and tax harm is inflicted on others in terms of just determining a state of just, just, tax justice in East Africa, Kenya is leading with the loss of about 565 million. 502 million is due to corporate tax abuse and 63 um, million is based on uh, offshore tax evasion. So the amounts in Kenya that are uh, hidden, which accounts to about 36.2% um, of uh, public health expenditure. Uh, and when you see the, the effect on nurses is about 240,000 nurses. Uh, comparing this to what we actually have, which is about 20,000, you can see that how it affects uh, public health uh, expenditure. So if we could have uh, been able to get a lot more nurses that we need in this critical crisis point, um, we have actually shortchanged ourselves completely. This is, this is in dollars. This, this, this is all in dollars. So you can see we are shortchanging ourselves in terms of getting the, the necessary personnel. At this point, especially at the crisis point, we need a lot more nurses, but we are essentially setting up a system that is shortchanging ourselves. Um, so in terms of, that was in Kenya, but in terms of the, the region, it's uh, $1 billion. Um, and the effect on nurses, about 500,000 nurses for the region. Now, so in that respect, then if we go back to the structural drivers, what is it that is emerging in the East Africa region? Two main things. First, we are developing or an, an, a network of double taxation agreements is emerging in the region that in as much as it is intended to ease the cost of doing business in the region, but it is also now going to attract illicit financial flows uh, going out. This is then going to be supported by the development of the international financial, financial centers where the bulk of uh, financial activity will be taking place uh, in, 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 in essence to enhance this uh, ease of doing business. Now, essentially, the intention has been that these two aspects will attract invest, investment into the region. Uh, governments across the region are looking for investment as a means of promoting structural, invest, uh, structural transformation. But then these two factors are actually the issues that will attract both criminal and corporate tax abuse in the region. So if we take the issues of uh, double taxation agreements, these agreements are set up in such a way to uh, limit the number of times you are taxed on income. In that you determine where and how and for what reason that you will be taxing an income uh, so that if it is simplified, you can attract more companies into your jurisdiction. Nonetheless, uh, there are a number of issues of concern. One, uh, the determination of where uh, an entity will be taxed and how that will be the case. Are they taxed based on where they, they are producing um, a wealth or are they taxed based from where they are coming from? So these issues are normally determined within the uh, double taxation agreement. Secondly is the issue of treaty shopping. Now, a lot of countries through double taxation agreements set lower tax rates. And this then creates an environment where multinationals are now shopping for areas or places where they can get the lowest tax available. In essence, then, countries that are very keen to get this investment are in a competition that harms them in that they are all competing to reduce their tax rates. And that means it's been uh, detrimental to them in, in uh getting domestic revenue mobilization. So there is this kind of uh, 
Treaty tax market where people are looking for where is the lowest tax, and that in terms of respond in terms of how government is responding to that, it ends up being detrimental to themselves. Uh, then there's the issue of round tripping, where now you realize people within your jurisdictions who are trying to get lower tax rates are going setting up count companies in other jurisdictions so that they get the same benefits <laughs> of lower tax rates. Uh, Last, I think I remember there was a, a situation where a Kenyan company invested in Uganda, but it did so as a Mauritian company. And this does not work in terms of the East Africa Treaty in that, you know, we've kind of, we are trying to harmonize our taxation and treatment with our, uh, our colleagues within the region. So the question then became, do we tax that company as Kenyan now that we know it's Kenyan or do we tax it as a Mauritian company? Yet the Kenyan company is looking for benefits as a Mauritian entity, claiming it is Mauritius. But when you look at the beneficial ownership, uh, there's that, that issue there. Now, again, after that, you have the issue of uh, the principle of tax neutrality. So that principle then gets affected that Parties that are in similar circumstances ought to be taxed based on the same rates on the same incomes. So the distortion that happens there about means that uh, there's challenges to issues such as competition. If I am by any chance to be a company that supplies paper, I cannot compete with the Mauritian company supplying paper and so forth. And this is across industries. So that principle then gets... Um, gets gets undermined then lastly the issue of limitation of treaty benefits so when you go into the specifics of taxation that are outlined within a number of these treaties um, governments then become limited as to how they can derive revenues from a number of entities so based on whether it's the stipulation of who are the members and so on and so forth there is a limitation of how much benefit can governments get based on the treaties that they are making? So as, as, I, as I was kind of explaining, with the DTA network in East Africa, um, Kenya is essentially becoming a hub in this respect, in this game of competitions. Um, maybe I could try again and zoom in so that uh, I can make it clearer. Is that clearer? Yes. So I'll, I'll also just read through. Um, Kenya has the highest number of DTAs in the region. That is at 48 treaties. And these treaties are since independence. Nonetheless, when the new constitution came in, uh, there are about 12 to 14 of these treaties that have been uh, concluded with the passage of the new constitution. So they had to be revamped. And also I think because of that, it gave uh, countries an opportunity to kind of uh, negotiate with Kenya to get new treaties. Uh, around that point also you find in this period, Kenya has been uh, coming up with the Nairobi International Financial Center, which I'll speak to, but yeah. So there is a climate in which Kenya is in the lead in terms of getting these treaties that uh pushing this nonetheless across the board there are a lot of inconsistencies um but then the east africa community also wanted to come up with a model double taxation agreement that kinds of harmonizes the activities for all of them uh all the east african countries have signed except tanzania um in terms of um, the countries with the most treaties in the region the first place goes to South Africa and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, these two have four, four treaties each. India and Mauritius come in second with three treaties each. Then countries with two treaties are China, Iran, Korea, Kuwait, the Netherlands, Singapore, uh, that have two treaties. Now, of those, uh, Singapore, the UAE, and the Netherlands are among 
the top 10 uh, problematic countries when it comes to illicit financial flows and uh, tax havens. So you can clearly see that that linkage has clearly happened um, onto the global space. Um, essentially, this demand for DTAs in the region uh, emerged um, in terms of the changing context of uh, constitutionalism. There's a lot of, uh, in this short period of time, there's been a lot of, inter of conversation about uh, the constitution, changing of laws, a setup of new public financial uh, management uh, uh, principles, growth in trade and services, discovery of um, natural resources, but also this, is a, this has been a period in which these kind of instruments have been fueled based on a new economic visioning that came up in the turn of the 21st century. So the ESC Vision 2050, AU Vision 2063, Burundi Vision 2025, Kenya Vision 2030, in which the Nairobi International Financial Center is anchored uh, same for Rwanda Vision 2050, Uganda 2040, and Tanzania 2025. So I, I'd like to apologize. I think um, it's not too clear, but this is from a forthcoming publication for which we will be launching and uh, we'll probably have a lot more to speak to this. But this just, it's supposed to show you uh, and answer two things. So for each country, uh, how many DTAs does each country have and who or which countries are these DTAs with? So, for instance, you will get to see how many DTAs Rwanda has, how many DTAs Kenya has and with which countries. Then maybe trying to pinpoint some of the aspects within those DTAs. So in terms of uh, permanent establishment, capital gains and so forth. But generally, after the publication of this work, we will kind of look into two other things. That is uh, how this emerging treaty network will affect uh, regional harmonization of DTA that is based on the ESC model treaty and then the legal implications. Because once we know the legal implications, then we can now start understanding how this will operate and how maybe multinationals will be using this network to avoid taxes. So again, a, a highlight of Burundi and Tanzania and Uganda. And uh, they are the questions that we thought we wanted to ask uh, about this. Now, essentially, now that you have the network, the region is moving in a space where there are two financial centers that are being set up, one in Nairobi and the other in Kigali. So Kigali seems to be very ready to move forward with this plan. I think a week ago they had uh, through the, uh, the private company that is leaving, leading this implementation called Rwanda Finance had a um, conversation where they were speaking about Rwanda is ready, open for investment. The investment code is open. The, they, are, they are open now to start this new financial ecosystem where the Kigali International Financial Center is part of their project called the Kigali Innovation City that champions financial innovation, but also technological innovation so that they are trying to improve the ease of doing business. And the selling point is that Rwanda will ensure compliance based on its competitive advantage of uh, their ability to ensure the rule of law. And that should be the, the point at which, or the issue that attracts investors into that country. Now in that process, then they have uh, kind of uh, changed a number of laws and also uh, brought in a new investment code to promote uh, investment in that country. Um, this is just a list of, for instance, the tax uh, benefits that uh, they are giving. Uh, corporate in income tax of zero, uh, preferential. So this for international companies, for holding companies, uh, for registered uh, investors who will be in Rwanda, uh, for export and in, uh, investments with holding tax, um, for those who will be in the Rwanda Stock Exchange, exchange 
uh, and so forth, up to capital gains tax. But this is also having other additional benefits. And I just pointed out immigration goodies like residency and a path to citizenship so as to attract uh, investors from around the world, similar to what other tax havens have been doing, whether it's the Cayman Islands and so on and so forth. So this is very clear that they are going to be doing this uh, so as to promote uh, investment there. So nonetheless, here are a number of the concerns um, that we have with how the KIFC is uh, being implemented. It's not clear how beneficial owners are being defined. Um, and other than just the definition, we find that uh, the setup is such that you won't be having timely access as, as to who are the beneficial owners. So that, and if you look at the, 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 the way it's set up, it's that if there is no direct uh, criminal aspect to what is happening with a particular uh, company, then no one would be bothered. Um, there is preference and ease of moving funds in and out of Rwanda. Uh, so the trigger to, uh, to start looking for who are the beneficial owners is criminal. But in any other sense, uh, it's like uh, there's a buffer there. Um, so essentially in terms of uh, if you need uh, tax information and so forth, uh, just to understand particularly the immoral aspect of uh, IFFs, then this is some form of buffer. And then um, after those two points, then there's the, the fact that there is a major vulnerability in that there's no recognition that this together with the other goodies are actually what the incentives that attract criminals to utilize uh, international financial center uh, like uh, the Kigali International, so that recognition. So it seems that um, the institutions in place have pegged themselves on compliance as being really the end all and be all that will make this thing run smoothly. Yet we know in the real sense, in what has been described as the exclusive money land, uh, they are actually setting up the system that will um, encourage illicit financial flows. Um, we have the same issue in uh, Kenya. I think uh, there is a legislation in place, the Nairobi International Financial Center, that seeks to cut the red tape, um, encourage non residents to participate more in this financial center. And just by the description, just uh, low or zero taxation, moderate financial regulation, banking secrecy and anonymity are some of the things that are encouraged or will be promoted in terms of uh, encouraging investors into the center. So, but then the concerns is that there is, it's very opaque uh, in terms of how it's being set up. Um, and it's not known how this NIFC structure is coming about. Um, a lot of it is through rumor and innuendo. You hear that there is a board and whatnot. But in terms of the actual interaction with the public to understand that how to understand how this will affect or improve investment in the region, this is not really taking place. Um, there is somewhat of some undue influence from the executive that is pushing for this NIFC because it is directly pegged as a Vision 2030 uh, project for success. And so um, that is then curtailing the civic education and public edu education that should be involved in terms of its establishment. Uh, and lastly, there is a complexity in the provisions of this legislation. This is therefore curtailing parliamentary debate. Um, probably again, another shroud of secrecy around the NIFC which is uh, making or kind of setting it up to make things more difficult. Um, so further, because of how it is set up, obviously then 
uh, the NIFC could actually end up undermining crucial uh, goals for tax collection and domestic revenue gen generation. As it is, we have been behind our uh, tax goals for quite a while. Now, if you're setting up a system in which you will be reducing revenues or giving preferential treatment, uh, then you're actually undermining yourselves in terms of the domestic revenue goals that you're sharing. Then, of course, the propagation of uh, illicit financial flows. Um, I think this was in 2018, 2017, thereabouts. Uh, organizations such as I think it was the East Af the, the, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission have been highlighting how a country like Mauritius is one of the destinations where corrupt uh, proceeds end up. Uh, you realize that um, Kenya signed a treaty with Mauritius, a treaty that um, a sister organization, uh, Tax Justice Network, challenged. But other than Kenya, as I had mentioned, uh, a country like Singapore, a country like the UAE, a country like Netherlands are high-risk jurisdictions where a lot of IFFs uh, go. Countries like uh, the US are really struggling with the Netherlands, for instance, as companies have moved there and they transfer a lot of their and of their of their profits on that into that jurisdiction and therefore cannot be taxed. Um, and this, especially if you look at the tech companies, um, another case obviously has been that if you take um, our 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 situation with the sport pesa, I think it was really well covered in terms of how. Um, money was being transferred to the UK uh, and also you could see how interesting and how it kind of turned out in terms of what they were doing, sponsoring teams out there and on, because they were flush with cash and therefore it is a system in which you can uh, move your money in and out of several juris jurisdictions. So I'd like to leave it there, uh, maybe opening it up for questions. Uh,